Welcome back, everyone, to Let's Talk Sarcoidosis. I'm your host, Dorothea Howard, and alongside of me is my co-host, Richard Hanna. How are you today, Rich? I'm doing great. How are you doing today, Dorothea? I'm doing wonderful. Thank you. And today, for the third appearance, <laughs> we have Dr. Chen, who's back at the studio. Welcome, Dr. Chen. Thank you so much for coming back to the show. Oh, of course. Well, th thank you for having me again. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. one of the reasons that we're, we're glad that you're back, back, Dr. Chen, is because during the last episodes that you were on, we have had many inquiries about people who are newly diagnosed. And we've talked about a variety of topics on our Let's Talk Sarcoidosis show, but we've never spent a, you know, a show talking about people who just got diagnosed. So today with you on the show, we're able to address any concerns and fears of people who just got that dreaded diagnosis. Sure. So help us out, Dr. Chen. Um, one of the things about the questions that people were asking, when they're diagnosed with mm -hmm. sarcoidosis, uh, do they have to worry about whether or not they have to see a particular doctor, you know, a specialist? Um, well, let's just take a step back just uh -huh. before that. Um, I, I agree that a lot of times when patients uh, are told that they have sarcoidosis, mm -hmm. they, they, don't, they, they often don't really know what that, what that means mm -hmm. or how to take that. Mm -hmm. um, and if we use a, a slightly um, different example for uh, just to kind of see why this might happen. Okay. Um, you know, if we were to think about much more common medical problems like asthma and diabetes, mm -hmm. you know, they're pretty common in the general population. So it's um, not a, it's it pretty frequently other people in the community may be able to, you know, offer their own stories or share their experiences about um, either the, their own asthma or somebody else's, uh, some relative's asthma or, or, or diabetes. Mm -hmm. um, and for sarcoidosis, since it's not a very common disease, mm -hmm. you know, that pool of stories and experiences really isn't there. So it's not easy for, you know, people who are told they have sarcoidosis to kind of get any kind of reassurance from their community. Mm -hmm. um, and in a way, it, the same kind of thing happens, uh, you know, when the patients, you know, are, are seeking some medical advice about sarcoidosis. Uh, again, since sarcoidosis is not, very, uh, not a very common disease, um, it's possible that the doctor they're working with may not necessarily have treated many patients with sarcoidosis. Mm -hmm. And so it's not that they're not, so that that doctor may not necessarily be able to um, offer this the kind of like assurance uh, and guidance that the patient's looking for. Um, right. Um, so, it, you know, it, I guess the related question that, that you know, that mm -hmm. uh, some of your viewers are asking about would be, which is whether, like, what kind of doctors a, per, a patient with sarcoidosis yes. should be seeing. Mm -hmm. um, I think in general, I mean, the, the, probably the most important thing would be that uh, the, the patient be wor work with a doctor that essentially pays attention uh, mm -hmm. you know, to, to them and just kind of, like, listens to what, they're, you know, experience, what they are experiencing. Mm -hmm. That's very important. Yes. So, for example, you know, if, they, if that patient... Um, already had a regular doctor that knew mm -hmm. them very well through the years. Um, I think it's I mean, the first step is just simply making sure that doctor, the regular doctor who knows them well, mm -hmm. is up to date uh, on the fact that they just recently found to have sarcoidosis. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then everything else really should, should fall into place. Okay. Um, you, some patients, as you sort of alluded to, um, do get concerned or wonder, you know, should, do I need to see a sarcoidosis specialist? Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of, it depends. Okay. Um, so again, if we use the, another, a, a more common type of an example, mm -hmm. um, in a different patient who is just found to have, you know, a mild case of diabetes, mm -hmm. um, and since diabetes is a relatively common problem, mm -hmm. um, you know, they, it, usually uh, most regular doctors have enough experience to kind of manage or take mm -hmm. care of most uh, cases of diabetes. Um, but of course, you know, if it's a much more severe case of diabetes that, or their blood sugar is very difficult to, to control mm -hmm. or if their diabetes has already led to some complications such as um, mm -hmm. damage to some organs like a kidney or an eye problem, then that uh, usually that their doctor will send them to see a, a specialist, either okay. a diabetes specialist or, or endocrinologist. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it, it just kind of depends. I mean, it is, it is possible that the regular doctor might be able to give them some guidance. Right. Um, 
Uh, but in other situations, um, you know, the, the doctor should also be able to, you know, work with the patient and, and let mm -hmm. them know, you know, well, you know, maybe some of the things that you're experiencing now is sort of out of my, out of my own comfort zone. Right. You know, and you know, even in my own practice, I, I it's important for for me to realize when I when I need to, to arrange for the the patient to see somebody else for a specific question, um, okay. like a you know, neurologist or something like that. And that's what I was going to ask mm -hmm. you, Dr. Chen. And for those who haven't seen previous episodes with Dr. Chen, mm -hmm. he uh, works at Johns Hopkins, and that's one of the other top hospitals um, that treat uh, sarcoidosis patients that has a dedicated clinic mm -hmm. for sarcoidosis. And what I wanted to ask you, because a lot of patients mm -hmm. will ask us about this, Dr. Chen, when does a patient really need to see other doctors when they're newly diagnosed with sarcoidosis? Like, when do they have to see that specialist? Right. So, um, I guess one, uh, the, one way to, to think about that, again, is, it, you know, um, most patients probably can be managed by the regular doctor mm -hmm. and, and maybe one other person that sort of focuses on their sarcoidosis. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, I, I guess putting in the context of a patient who's newly found as, uh, to have sarcoidosis. Mm -hmm. um, again, if we use the diabetes example, the person's found to have diabetes, mm -hmm. uh, and that the doctor agrees that the patient, what the patient's experiencing, their symptoms, maybe their fatigue, and some other things, are due to diabetes. And if the doctor treats the diabetes and mm -hmm. the patient feels better, then everything would then seem to make sense, and right. everything's sort of like behaving as expected, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and the same thing goes, you know, for sarcoidosis. So saying that, you know, in a patient who uh, is experiencing, you know, shortness of breath and right. cough, and then is later found to have sarcoidosis that involves the lungs, mm -hmm. um, then the regular doctor should kind of take a step back. Number one, make sure that there really isn't any other reason for them to be experiencing the, mm -hmm. you know, their symptoms. Right. Um, and then, you know, also make sure that the patient's symptoms improve with treating sarcoidosis. Mm -hmm. Now. If it turns out that the, their doctor doesn't um, think that sarcoidosis is an ac adequate explanation for their, you know, cough and shortness of breath, or if their symptoms, uh, the patient's symptoms don't get better with treatment, then I think that would be a straightforward situation where okay. it'd be useful to send the patient uh, to see um, a, another doctor that that has expertise in sarcoidosis. Okay, because I was about to ask you, right. are there any other medical reasons? that uh, a patient would need to see a specialist because we know that it's a multi-systematic disease and then sometimes people have other illnesses on top of the sarcoidosis. So medically, when is it time for them, you know, to, to see other specialists right. or other things too? So again, it kind of depends on each person's situation. Mm -hmm. um, but um, one scenario, one possibility would be it's not unreasonable sometimes to consider um, a consultation about the sarcoidosis mm -hmm. um, early, like for instance, soon after diagnosis. Right. And, and so for some people, um, you know, it's either the patient or their regular doctor actually just wants to um, have a second opinion to make sure that the sarcoidosis that is the correct diagnosis. Right. Um, also to make sure to uh, to figure out like how extensive the sarcoidosis is, you know, what other parts of the body other than say the lungs right. might be involved with sarcoidosis. Mm -hmm. um, and then to sort of evaluate uh, treatment options or whether okay. or not the patient needs to be treated actually. There mm -hmm. are certainly some patients where the right next step is actually just to observe them, you to know, watch, watch them. them. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, and then, you know, in other situations for patients who've had you know, who, who are known to have sarcoidosis and may have already been, have been treated for a number of years. Mm -hmm. um, a consultation at that point might be useful to just kind of reassess the situation. Um, are they receiving the right therapy or actually do they still need to be, be treated? Um, some patients with sarcoidosis, even if they needed treatment um, up front in the beginning, maybe through the years, you know, their disease activity starts to kind of like uh, wane, kind of become less and less. Okay. And some patients actually might not need treatment after uh, several years. Okay. It's always important for the patient to kind of work with the doctors yes. and not just, you know, change their doses or right. stop the medications. Right. Um, but Don't self-medicate. Right. Doctors, uh, management. Um, right. But again, that, that could be another reason to uh, have a consultation with uh, like a, a sarcoidosis expert, for example. Okay. Um, 
you know, so I think those are part of the, the, the main um, mm -hmm. th situations. Um, and getting back to the, the, the our, you know, the, I guess our focus today for patients who are newly found to have sarcoidosis, mm -hmm. um, you know, we rec we know that um, pa um, it, patients who ha who are found to have sarcoidosis aren't always conveniently, you know, living near a university center. Right. Uh, I may need to travel a distance. So mm -hmm. sometimes that first consultation um, may generate sort of a list of recommendations um, or basically a plan that the, mm -hmm. that the patient could take back to their local doctors, mm -hmm. uh, maybe to kind of like, you know, follow for the next year or so. Okay. And actually that ends up being how we handle, um, you know, some of the uh, cases of sarcoidosis that we uh, help help with um, from patients who are from out of state. Can you tell them a little bit about how Johns Hopkins handle those type of situations for some of the patients that contact you? I know you get inquiries. Well, um, just maybe a case by case scenario. Right. Well, so if um, we we obviously you know receive many um, referral requests mm -hmm. um, from either within driving distance or outside driving distance. Right. Um, we, you know, certainly there's a phone number if you were to contact um, Johns Hopkins right. to, to find uh, our, our contact number. Um, also to try to, I guess, make it a little bit easier for that first contact to happen. We have uh, sort of general email, sarcoidosis at jhmi.edu. Okay. Um, we ask that patients, in addition to a record, if they're able to have sort of like a summary letter mm -hmm. you know, from their one of their doctors. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be extensive, but just okay. kind of like give us a... Um, the context or the reason for the for consultation. The okay. Um, there are some patients where it's just simply a consultation, either begin oh. in the beginning or you know in the middle of their course. For others, it's really uh, for. Uh, there are some patients who refer because they are very sick and either they can't um, tolerate the medications that, oh. that their local doctors have tried or mm -hmm. um, or, or still getting worse. You know, wow. and so without that um, cover letter. It's sometimes hard for us to kind of like uh, to triage, sure. you know, to set priorities just because of the sheer number of um, referrals. So that that actually is is, is important. Okay. Um, just a little letter from one of their doctors. Okay. Um, for do for patients who are coming to us um, with sarcoidosis, and if they seem to have s major involvement of more than one organ system, say mm. a person who has both lung disease and heart disease from sarcoidosis. Um, for some of these patients, it might make sense to see if we can coordinate um, a visit with both our clinic and maybe, say, um, somebody from the cardiology department who also has an interest in cardiac sarcoidosis. Okay. Um, again, without a letter up front, um, we, mm -hmm. we won't know that ahead of time, and okay. particularly for our out-of-state patients, if they kind of, you know, make, it, um, make that as part of the, um, you know, request for that first sure. consultation, we can try to coordinate that try to get as much out of that, um, that first visit. So that's an important step. Right, just to frame out uh, right. what the uh, consultation uh, okay. sh is sort of like, um, is, is about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, what other doctors should a patient with sarcoidosis need to see? Um, so, again, it kind of depends on each person's uh, uh, situation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if a person has, and it kind of depends on really like how bad the sarcoidosis has gotten. Mm -hmm. So for a person who has, uh, you know, severe lung disease from sarcoidosis, they may actually, you know, you know should be seeing a, a, a lung doctor is, you know, one of the physicians in, in addition to the regular doctor. In particular, if the um, sarcoidosis expert is not necessarily, it may not necessarily be a lung doctor, maybe mm -hmm. say a rheumatologist. And so that person with severe lung disease should be also see a, um, a lung specialist. Mm -hmm. For patients who have, say, heart failure from sarcoidosis, mm -hmm. they probably should also be seeing a cardiologist as well. Okay. Um, and how can patients find information about doctors that have experience with sarcoidosis? Right. So that's a that's a that's a very good question. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes, you know, you know, it, it's when we get consultations, particularly from patients from across, the, you know, the other that's side of the country, mm -hmm. um, we also. It, you know, just think, you know, whether or not they happen to live closer to uh, another center um, with some expertise in sarcoidosis, mm -hmm. uh, just because of the logistics and, and, you know, travel that might right. be involved, otherwise be involved. So um, 
for that type of information, uh, as you mentioned, Dorothea, actually, mm -hmm. many um, sarcoidosis experts usually are part of a, a known sarcoidosis clinic. Yes. And many of these clinics are located or are part of a uh, university medical center. So mm -hmm. university medical centers are a great, great place to start to see if they have a sarcoidosis clinic um, okay. uh, or sarcoidosis program. Um, another important resource would be uh, patient advocacy groups or mm -hmm. patient support groups. Okay. You know, and there are a couple of uh, large national ones, um, okay. and one of them is called the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research. Mm -hmm. um, and um, but again, there are also some you know smaller you know local right. um, patient support groups as well. And mm -hmm. in Maryland, one one of the larger ones I, I believe is something called um, the Life and Breath Foundation. Mm -hmm. Uh, so both patient advocacy groups and, right. and patient support groups often will have you know lists of doctors um, uh, that um, have expertise um, in, in with dealing with um, sarcoidosis. Okay. Um, and these patient advocacy groups also have other resources too: mm -hmm. information for patients, uh, their families, mm -hmm. um, and, and even for other doctors. Mm -hmm. um, and so, it, it, in fact, the, the, the patients' the advocacy groups actually also have, you know, up-to-date or growing lists of um, local patient support groups. Okay. And actually, the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research um, yes, has a listing huge. with with your name on yes. it as well <laughs> as, as an important resource yeah, in Maryland. <laughs> um, so I think, uh, again, you know, you know, outside of, of looking towards a university medical center, mm -hmm. um, you know, the patient advocacy groups and local support groups uh, are a very important resource. Yes, it is. Yeah. That's a big help right there. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh -huh. you know, in the time we have left, there are a few more questions that patients who are newly diagnosed with sarcoidosis want to know. You know, they want to know if they were going to die from sarcoidosis, and they also want to know if sarcoidosis is hereditary. Right. I mean, those two questions do come up a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess probably the better, best way to answer the first question uh, would be that I would have to say that as bad as sarcoidosis may seem to be, that mm -hmm. most patients with sarcoidosis probably won't die of their sarcoidosis. Um, even patients who need to be treated with medications for many years, um, those patients are much more likely to encounter or experience a complication for the medications actually than say die from their sarcoidosis. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, there's still, I mean, there are still p some patients who end up experiencing severe organ damage from yes. sarcoidosis, mm -hmm. like to lungs, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, actually, for patients with very severe lung disease that are sick enough to need a lung transplant, mm -hmm. unfortunately, this, you know, statistics which suggest that one out of every four patients with severe lung disease waiting for a lung transplant wow. might, might die waiting for a lung oh transplant, essentially. Wow. Um, so, so again, you know, I, I, we try to reassure patients that mm -hmm. sarcoidosis is, is, is certainly treatable, um, and usually we can you know, manage patients um, uh, for, for years, if necessary. Right. Um, so addressing this, the other, the second question, yeah. uh, which does come up a lot as well, mm -hmm. um, we do, as we talked about before, actually, we do think that sarcoidosis, uh, or why pay, a person might have sarcoidosis, is due to some genetic difference with their immune system, okay. making them predisposed to having sarcoidosis. Mm -hmm. So again, you know, if we're saying that there's something genetically different about the immune system, then, you know, it, it basically means that. Uh, at some level, it is probably inheritable to some degree. Right. But what that means uh, would um, is that let's just use some numbers to frame right. this out. Um, okay. So, in in general, um, we expect to find one case of sarcoidosis amongst ten thousand people in the in the general population. Okay. But for patients with sarcoidosis, uh, what that translates to is that within um, Amongst first-degree relatives of patients with sarcoidosis, we would expect higher rates of sarcoidosis. And some small studies do support that mm -hmm. um, thought. And so it's been observed that perhaps amongst first-degree relatives from um, of patients with sarcoidosis, mm -hmm. instead of one case per 10,000 in the general population, you might find five to 10 cases per 10,000 wow. population. Uh, 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 or 10,000 first degree relatives. Mm -hmm. So by the numbers, it's certainly more frequent than say, mm -hmm. finding sarcoidosis in the general population. But no matter how you look at the numbers, sarcoidosis still remains a rather uncommon disease. And okay. so we, we generally don't recommend it, that patients tell their family members to start looking for sarcoidosis, right. you know, for, particularly <laughs> right. if, they're not, if they're feeling yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the next question that I have, and okay. a lot of people ask this, 
What can a patient do, Dr. Chen, to improve their quality of life living with sarcoidosis? Right. So I think that's actually very important. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, sarcoidosis is, for some people, it seems to disappear after a few years, but for, mm -hmm. for many, um, uh, you know, it, it ends up being a sort of a chronic disease. Mm -hmm. um, and so there certainly are some things that patients can do to, you know, improve the quality of life, improve mm -hmm. their experience with sarcoidosis. Mm -hmm. um, and some of, this, some of these recommendations are, may seem like common sense, and one of them being trying to, you know, live a healthy lifestyle, so to speak, right. uh, which includes remaining, um, trying to maintain as much act physical activity as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, what, and because one of the things that often happens when patients, um, you know, experience active sarcoidosis would, would be that they often stop what they, um, their usual activities, their regular activities, mm -hmm. or their exercise, if they were exercising before, they often stop all these things okay. when they're not feeling well. And then find it very difficult to kind of resume their regular mm -hmm. activities or even trying to exercise, you know, after they're feeling better. Um, and one major reason for this is that they've become deconditioned, which is okay. a fancy word for meaning out of shape. But, right. but this deconditioning um, ends up being yet another hurdle that the patients will need to kind of overcome in addition, in addition to their sarcoidosis. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it, it's more than just sort of like getting into better shape mm -hmm. that we want, we like for patients to um, be more active on a regular right. basis. But, you know, I believe that for patients who do exercise or, mm -hmm. or try to exercise on a regular basis, they're okay. essentially kind of like testing their lungs, so to speak, right. you know, a couple times a week. Mm -hmm. um, so they have a better sense of what their health status is. Okay. They'll have a better chance of noticing if their health status changes if they do exercise regularly. Mm -hmm. uh, or at least be able to notice a change earlier than somebody who's unable to exercise regularly. Mm -hmm. um, for patients who are not able to exercise regularly, then I, I think it would be really important for them to see if it makes sense for them to look for a physical therapy program, actually, okay. um, which is something that's often overlooked. For patients, uh, for example, for patients with bad lung disease, mm -hmm. uh, this would be a consideration to, uh, whether or not they should uh, participate in a pulmonary rehabilitation program. Okay. Um, and you know, and so along those lines, for patients who have you know, say heart disease or heart mm -hmm. failure from sarcoidosis, mm -hmm. um, participation in a um, cardiac rehabilitation program would be, you know, sort of like something to consider as well. Okay. And even more important for patients who have uh, neurological involvement with sarcoidosis, mm -hmm. which often sometimes is pretty devastating, oh. even those people can, you know, improve their quality of life through um, participation with a specific neurocognitive right. uh, rehabilitation program. Um, it's much like how a person who's suffered a stroke or other major neurological okay. problem uh, would basically do Go to, to rehabilitation, to, right? To, mm -hmm. to to get better. Um, and I was getting ready to ask you, and you did right. just kind of touch on some of that. I was about to ask you, uh, are there any types of, or what types of small steps mm -hmm. can patients begin to take? Um, who are newly diagnosed and who already have been living with uh, sarcoidosis because some people are in wheelchairs and they can't be too physical as far as activity. So are there small steps that they can take to improve the quality of their life? Well, so even patients with in, in, who are incapacitated and unable to, mm -hmm. to walk, I, I think um, should have a consultation with a physical therapy program. Okay. I mean, because unless you ask, Right. You know, the, the worst thing could, that could happen perhaps would be that even the physical therapist might just say that they're just simply, I don't know, too weak or uh, too, too, too work to work with. Participate. But, but for uh -huh. most people, um, and for most people, they haven't been part of that type of a program. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's really worth um, an assessment by okay. somebody who, whose business is to try to get people back on their feet. Right. Um, wow. Geez. Well, you know, Dr. Chen, I tell you, we could have you here all day <laughs> to talk about, you know, we probably would never have enough information for patients who are newly diagnosed, and we definitely want to thank you for being a part of the show. But before we end the show, is there anything else that you would like to offer the um, advice to as far as the newly diagnosed patients that are viewing this uh, segment? Right. So I, I, I think that... Um, one thing that uh, we've mentioned that, that is important is mm -hmm. uh, really for patients to keep an ear and um, an eye and an ear open mm -hmm. for 
local patient support resources, okay. so local support groups like your own efforts, okay. for example. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, if they actually found a good resource, mm -hmm. um, uh, I would ask that it would be good for them to sort of circulate that. You know, basically start that those sets of stories and right. um, uh, you know experiences that otherwise would have been shared for much more common diseases. Sure. Maybe even share them with. Um, a larger local group like the Life and Breath Foundation, mm -hmm. saying that it, that what you found exists, right. or even contacting the uh, foundations uh, for cell right. research so they can be listed. Okay. Um, I think communication is very important. Right. Um, obviously, you know that's the point, of, yeah. part one of the points of your Definitely. show. Mm -hmm. um, and for uncommon disease like this, I think um, just again, you know, simply asking for the, p the patient to help, you know, in, in, with their participation, letting us know. Right. It, it, you know, if they found a good resource would be important. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Chen, and I know that this show is very helpful today uh, because it's more focusing on the newly diagnosed as well as resources. Um, when you watch this show, please look at the uh, credits and contact Johns Hopkins and find out what other steps you can take and use those available resources that Dr. Chen has explained to you. Um, if you don't have any groups in your area, you know, you may want to consider starting your own group. Right. You know, start your own group. Be proactive. Don't wait for another group or a group that's not in your area. Just grab some people that you know that can help educate others and just start your own. Till next time, stay positive. Live your life. Don't self-medicate. Follow the, the regimen of a physician that, you know, can help you with your quality of life. Thank you so much for watching. Be blessed. And as I always say, we yeah, all have sarcoidosis, but sarcoidosis does, does not have, have us. us. Thank you.